This is not a topic that you're going to hear talked about on most NFL media shows, especially the ones on like Sunday mornings, because quite frankly, it's very complex. It's very nuanced. There's a lot of scheme stuff that goes into it. It's not something that you can just kind of talk about in five minutes and then gloss over to the next topic. It's really meaty, but I believe that all of you are ready and that we're at this point where we can talk about the nuances of run fits and how run defenses even function, how it's tied into coverage, and perhaps most importantly, why it's so important in the modern NFL. Because run fits, believe it or not, make the world go round. If you can stop the run in certain fronts and certain coverages and still be really effective as a pass defense on top of that because you're in certain fronts and certain coverages, there's very little that an offense can do to stop you. So uh, that's what we're going to get into today. In a particular, we're going to look at this rematch between the 49ers and Packers from their first meeting back in week three, because believe it or not, how the Packers fit the run in that game might be one of the most important schematic discussions that we can possibly have when it comes to not just this matchup, but every remaining matchup in the NFL playoffs. But with all that being said, first things first, what is a run fit and why does it matter? When you hear the word run fit, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's how all of the players in the defense fit themselves into the blocking scheme of an opposing run game. Think of it like two halves of a zipper meshing into one another. That ultimately is the goal of any defense when trying to stop the run. You get at least one body into every single gap, just like a zipper. That essentially is a run fit. Now, how a defense goes about fitting that run is all about alignment and technique, more so than just raw strength or speed. And to be honest, the coverage that is called on the back end of the play is a big factor, possibly the biggest factor even, in determining the techniques that a defense is gonna use to fit that run. Because believe it or not, a coverage call will determine how many bodies are available in the box to fit that run in the first place. Let's use this play from early on in the week three matchup as an example. The Packers are in a bear look here with a three technique, a zero tech nose tackle, another three technique, and then two nine techniques on the edges as well with a two high safety quarters coverage look on the back end. The Mike linebacker is in what's called a 50 alignment on the second level, which is basically the same thing as a five technique defensive end, except you add a zero to it because he's a linebacker, five technique, 50, same thing, you get the correlation. Meanwhile, the will linebacker is lined up as a 10 or the linebacker equivalent of a one technique defensive tackle. The Niners are in 21 personnel, meaning two backs, one tight end, and they have seven blockers in the core of the formation to account for seven players in the box, sort of, for the Packers. Theoretically, the 49ers have good numbers here to make this run work, because it's seven blockers for seven defenders, and the run scheme that San Francisco has dialed up here is probably best described as basically a toss zone lead play, except you've got Debo Samuel as the ball carrier off of orbit motion. He's kind of getting an end around, so his track is a little bit different, but the blocking scheme is pretty much toss zone lead. And then you also have an inside zone run just inside of that as eye candy, just to try to make the linebackers second guess themselves and not get to their landmarks in time. It's a very creative run scheme. And again, theoretically, the 49ers have the numbers here to make this work because the Packers are in a too high safety shell, so they're down a man in the box. But it's the specific techniques that the Packers are using along the defensive line to quote unquote steal some gaps back in their favor that allow them as a whole unit to still fit this run perfectly anyway. In particular, their play side nine technique, Preston Smith, who's number 91, he is coached to use what's called a nine jam seven technique when he gets a base block from a tight end, or in this case, a base block from a fullback playing tight end, Kyle Juszczyk. The nine jam seven technique means that Smith will take on the block from Juszczyk and then work back inside of it to get into the C gap rather than staying outside in the D gap as a force player. And that means that Smith and the rest of the front seven can do what's called spill and kill. You gum up everything on the inside with big bodies like Smith that shoot those gaps and spill the run to the outside where everyone else can then kill it. 
Now, while all of this is going on with Preston Smith, the play side three technique is also working his way across the face of his block to pressure that block and also to help close down that C gap as well. So the fullback, or rather tight end playing fullback because George Kittle is in that role here, he now has a choice to make. He can either take the block inside or outside depending on how he's reading the space in front of him. Inside would take him directly into Smith and probably just further clog up that gap. And outside would take him directly into a 2-1-1 scenario with the Mike linebacker in the corner who can both kind of leverage that block from either side anyway and still probably make the tackle. Either way, regardless of where Kittle is leading, Debo now likely has to bounce this run outside because of that 9-jam-7 technique from Smith. And the Mike linebacker in the play side corner both know that this run will likely be spilled just because of how they're coached as a unit to play this run from the coverage they're in. So they both know that pretty much all they have to do is just get over the top and clean up to the outside. As you can see, during the play, Preston Smith did get that two for one that he was hoping for with that nine jam seven, which put the numbers back in favor of the Packers in terms of blockers to defenders. The mic and the corner were waiting patiently outside, while Devondre Campbell was doing what's called a cloudy or clear read off of that three technique so that he knew which gap, if any, to shoot. Since the three technique was able to pressure his block well to the front side, Campbell did what's called reading clear on the front side A gap, and so he just shot right through that gap, which again helped to force the running back to bounce all the way to the front side into the waiting arms of the Mike linebacker and Jair Alexander. All in all, that is what a sound run fit looks like. It's not just about numbers or power or speed, even though all of those things obviously help. It's about technique and fitting everyone into the right gaps at the right time in order to force the ball to go wherever you want it to go. As another example, later on in the game, the 49ers tried to throw a counter punch off of that toss zone lead look with Debo just to see if they could catch the Packers sleeping for once. But again, because of how disciplined as a team they are in their run fits, it resulted in pretty much the same thing. That same thing, of course, being a two yard run. The key difference between this play design and the last one we broke down is that George Kittle, still playing the role of fullback, is now no longer lead blocking for Debo on the end around, and in fact, he's coming across on a kickout block for a concept known as split zone. Split zone is a very common run design, probably one of the most common these days, to be honest, because it does a pretty reliable job of kicking out the backside edge player in order to force open a cutback lane behind this backside double team from the right guard and right tackle. There's a few different ways that defenses can play this, obviously, but again, because the Packers are in a quarters coverage look, which determines the techniques that they're gonna be using up front, they're gonna play this the same way they did last time, which is, of course, spill it and kill it. The number one goal of this backside edge player, Chauncey Rivers, is to identify that this kickout block is coming and shoot inside of it. It's very similar to the 9-jam-7 technique, but not quite the same, but it accomplishes pretty much the same thing. He cannot let himself get caught on Kittle's outside shoulder because that's gonna open up an easy cutback lane for Trey Sermon. He has to attack the inside shoulder, gum up that C gap, and try to force this ball to bounce back outside where they still have that two-on-one from the DBs that can finish the job. In the secondary, when it comes to playing this run, this is what's known as a crack and replace technique. So if the corner reads the crack block from Ayuk on the safety, he needs to come downhill aggressively and replace on that crack block so that he can handle the edge and if not make the tackle himself, at least force the running back to cut back again to the inside where all of his help from his linebackers and defensive linemen are. In this specific instance, Sermon didn't really have time to stop and start and then bounce back again to the outside once Rivers took away that cutback lane because he was following so close to Kittle on that kickout block. So he just got tripped up by Rivers and only got a couple yards anyway. And once again, that is a win for this defense. Run fits are more about alignment and technique and just putting the right body in the right place at the right time. And you're basically just corralling the ball to where you want it to go. If you can do that even when you don't have an explicit numbers advantage in the box, it's going to be really, really hard to run against your team. Now, you may be wondering, after watching all of that, 
Okay, Brett, I understand what you just said, but why are they doing this exactly? Why are the Packers sitting in quarters coverage of all looks all day long, even from base 3-4 personnel, even on first and 10 against very run heavy looks? Why are they risking playing light boxes against the 49ers run game? Well, for starters, they did it because they could, but more importantly, it's those two high safety looks on early downs that took away the most explosive early down play that the 49ers have, which is crossing routes off of hard play action. The Packers always wanted to make sure that they would have a two high safety look so that at least one of their safeties would be able to leverage these crossing routes and take them away because if they could take away those crossing routes, there really wasn't much else that the 49ers can do in the passing game in order to get big chunks of yards. They're not going to be hitting on deep posts way down the field in order to punish those quarters looks, which is something that offenses at least try to do, but the Niners are just not very good at it. Lord knows they also can't just line up in a three by one look and throw nine routes down the boundary to their one isolated receiver because again, they just don't really have a quarterback that can do that consistently unlike some other teams, cough cough Cincinnati. I mean, truth be told, the 49ers are just not a very versatile passing game. Hell, that lack of versatility is why they drafted Trey Lance and his howitzer of an arm in the first place. With Jimmy under center, they really only have one way to throw the ball down the field, and the Packers took that away. Plus, at the same time, their defensive line was also disciplined enough that they could take away that run game while the secondary took away the play-action pass. For all intents and purposes, it was kind of the perfect game plan, and at least at first, it severely limited this 49ers offense. The interesting part about all of this though, and this is the point that I've been trying to build to this entire episode, is that even with their fastball taken away, which is the run game, and even with their curveball also taken away, which is the boot passing game, the 49ers still somehow put up 28 points and they had the lead with under a minute left. How exactly did they do that? And are those results replicable this weekend when the Packers are highly likely to use the exact same game plan again because they did the same thing pretty much all season? The answer, probably unsurprisingly to many of you, is the quick passing game. San Francisco couldn't run the ball and they couldn't throw it deep, so they really leaned into the one thing they still could do, which is throw it short and throw it quick. Again, the Packers played almost exclusively zone coverage in this game, and the majority of those zone coverages were quarters and cover three match. All Kyle Shanahan had to do, from a schematic perspective, was create what's called stretches in the zones. These could either be vertical stretches or horizontal stretches or both, but really all the Niners did in the second half was use the rules of match quarters coverage against the Packers in order to move underneath defenders where they wanted them to be moved so that they could create easy, exploitable passing windows for Jimmy Garoppolo. Whether it was stick routes, dragon concepts, double pivots, a speed dig underneath a safety they got opened up because a linebacker got pulled out of the passing window. I mean, they did it all. There was even a play where they got Kittle to draw multiple defenders on a swing route off of orbit motion. Jimmy pump faked that and then came back inside and hit Juszczyk over the middle for another first down. And that set up a touchdown that cut their deficit to only a field goal halfway through the fourth quarter. And to be honest, the last couple minutes of the first half and the entire second half were one of the greatest play calling clinics that Kyle Shanahan has ever put on because the defense took away his entire comfort zone. And yet were it not for Aaron Rodgers being, well, you know, Aaron Rodgers, they still probably would have won that game. Even without being able to run the ball and even with Garoppolo's longest completion of the day only traveling for 16 yards, they still almost won. And that to me is why I think they still have a shot this weekend, believe it or not. Will they win? I mean, I'd still probably favor Green Bay just because of who their quarterback is and the fact that Garoppolo is apparently playing through, I don't know, every kind of injury you can imagine. But I truly do expect this game to go similar to the last one from a schematic perspective in that Green Bay is probably going to stop the run again from two high safety looks and they're going to force Jimmy to have to do everything by himself all over again. Will he be able to rise to that task for the second time in the same season, even through all of his injuries? Well, I guess we'll find out. So that is everything that you need to know, at least a little bit under surface level, about how the 49ers offense matches up with the Green Bay defense. I fully expect the Packers to basically just copy and paste their game plan over from the last game because they really did not do anything fancy at all. 
it was basically one coverage for 80% of the time uh, with a few different fronts here and there, but they really didn't do anything crazy. And for the most part, they got the results they wanted. The real question to me is what is Kyle Shanahan going to do this weekend? Because honestly, he's starting this week in a little bit of a hole. Yes, he does have a different running back that's a little bit more dynamic in the backfield, but he also has a very injured quarterback and they're going up against a defense that knows how to play against this style of offense. I'm sure he has some ideas for how to generate a run game and, you know, maybe how to create some matchups in the deep passing game. I'm not an NFL coach, so I'm sure that he's a lot better at thinking of ways to do that than me. And at least for that reason alone, I'm excited to watch this game because I want to see how Kyle Shanahan coaches his way out of this hole. It's not impossible. And if anybody can do it, it's probably him. But that being said, thank you to all of you for watching and thank you to this week's sponsor, HelloFresh, for helping to make this show possible. It is the new year after all, which means it's time for New Year's resolutions. And for many of you, that means trying to eat healthier, trying to make high quality home cooked meals for yourself more often, and trying not to spend so much money buying food and ingredients that you might not even need. HelloFresh can help you do all of those things with 50 weekly menu items to choose from so you don't have to think so hard about what you want for dinner every single night. You can get calorie smart and carb smart options as well as pescatarian or even vegetarian options if you so choose. And each recipe comes entirely with fresh ingredients that are all pre-portioned out so that you don't need any extra trips to the grocery store. If you want it made even easier with even less prep time, they also have quick and easy options like 20 minute meals, easy cleanup meals, and low prep options as well. So there is literally something for everyone regardless of your dietary or time restrictions. Plus, a University of Michigan study found that getting ingredients and recipes delivered from HelloFresh cuts down on your food waste by a whopping 25%. So this is a more sustainable way to cook for yourself at home as well. So if you want to try out HelloFresh for yourself, you can go to HelloFresh.com and use code FILMROOM16 for up to 16 free meals and three free surprise gifts, plus free shipping on your order. Again, that is HelloFresh.com, promo code FILMROOM16 for 16 free meals, three free surprise gifts, and free shipping on your first order. Thank you again to HelloFresh for partnering with us on this week's episode, and I'll see all of you next week.